How do scientists find out about the life of our ancestors? Did they imagine it all? Many normal people probably think just that, but ancient remains carry many clues. Like trained detectives, archaeologists, and anthropologists carefully examine every scratch and surface, carefully catalog the locations for all the finds, and then reconstruct the climate and the fauna. The end result reveals itself as a vivid picture of ancient life. It was a hot midday hour. South African sun scorched down from the white skies. A sleepy clip springer gazelle, or Eutragus, froze hidden in the tall brush. Dusty rock hyrexes hid from the heat as well. A group of Australopithecus africanus, bipedal apes, took shelter at the base of a giant acacia tree. The adults were busy doing their simple things, while a single child, because after all, Australopithecine children were just as curious as ours are today, unseen, stepped away from the group and away from the protective crown of the tree and the gaze of his currently distracted mother. A momentary flash of shadow, the powerful wings of an eagle first flattened and then whirled to dry grass. In 1924, numerous fossils were discovered at the South African mine of Tung. They piqued the interest of a doctor named Raymond Dart. Amongst numerous fossils of animals, he paid special attention to a single small skull, a delicate face with an articulated lower jaw, broken cranium with a naturally formed endocranium, or a mold of the brain cavity. Ape, apparently, but canines, too small, and the opening at the back of the skull, through which the spinal cord connects to the brain, was located at the bottom of the skull like in humans, and not in the back as with other apes. A year later, a short paper published in a nature magazine entitled Australopithecus africanus, humanoid ape from South Africa. At that time, the oldest human ancestor was considered to be Pithecanthropus from Java, that was rather a lot more human. Dart's discovery took a long time to lay down the path from the heads of scientists and onto the pages of textbooks. But many subsequent finds, first in South and then in East Africa, surely placed the Australopithecus as one of our human ancestors. Now we know that these creatures were truly the missing link between an absolute ape and a definite human. Skeletal finds showed us that their legs were already well suited for upright walking, however their heads did not get very far from their primitive prototype. But the story of the tongue child does not end with its impact on science alone. The skull belonged to a toddler, three to four years of age. We know this because the jaws still contain all of its baby teeth. But the first permanent molar has also came through. In modern children, this usually occurs around the age of six and apparently may have happened earlier in our ancestors. From the moment of its discovery, the nickname Tong Child firmly stuck to the find. The frontal lobe shines with signs of obvious trauma, sharp triangular depressions. Where did they come from? A few plausible options. First of all, the blows could have been dealt by other Australopithecus. However, the marks are too small. There are many of them, and none of them exhibit signs of penetration, which would have been expected. You see, when our ancestors wanted to break someone's head, they were quite a bit more professional about it. And we know this from many other finds, which are not quite as old. Second option is that the marks could have been left by the teeth of a leopard or a crocodile. But then, they would have been much bigger, and the tongue child's skull is small. It's more likely that a leopard or a crocodile would have swallowed it whole or crushed it to pieces. We are left with a third option, an attack by a giant eagle. Predatory birds, like the African golden eagle, actively hunt small monkeys, rock hyrexes, and other similarly sized animals. Moreover, by studying the bones and other remains copiously strewn about the nests of modern eagles, and by comparing them to the tongue's toposinosis, or the total sum of remains, showed many skulls of similarly eaten monkeys of similar size as the tongue child. They also have similar marks left by the bird's beak. They often have side punctured craniums and articulated lower jaws, which coincidentally never happens if the bones are deposited in water or found in remains of predation. In the Tong cave, besides the child, 
other bones of small primates were found, and which similarly fall under the above category. So it seems apparently that 2.7 million years ago, at this very spot, grew a very large tree, and on the branches of which hung a very large nest built by a very large eagle. The details of this scene we can reconstruct using the clues given to us by paleontology. In the vicinity of Tong, bones of antelopes were found as well as of two types of hyrexes, multiple species of baboons, and other primitive monkeys. All of which point to a savanna sparsely populated by large trees. The climate is then reconstructed as dry. Large eagles are normally active during the day. Australopithecus lived primarily in open terrain, although the construction of their hands still exhibit many signs of arboreal locomotion, such as curved phalanges or fingers, and so they likely still kept close to trees on which they could find shelter from predators. Of course, it wouldn't be science without a fair share of skeptics, some of which point to the fact that specifically those deposits in which the tongue child was discovered were formed by aquatic deposits that had nothing to do with eagles or nests, but then nothing stops an eagle from building a nest in a tree on the edge of a pond.